every place, in every age, people seek meaning in their lives. It is perhaps what defines us. We're meaning-seeking beings. We're purpose-driven beings. You give people everything and they still feel something's missing. And one day you leave your home to go find out what it is. Human beings have always pushed out into the unknown, seeking answers where other creatures would not. No matter how comfortable, no matter how much our wants and needs are catered for, we have that human hunger to reach out for more, to reach beyond the boundaries. We want to ask why. The search for meaning makes sense in a universe ordered by God. But there is a common view within science that seeking meaning is itself meaningless. And we should accept that we and the universe are nothing but atoms and molecules. People think that there should be meaning in my life. But, you know, we're a hiccup on the way from one oblivion to another. There are no deeper explanations than those that science provides. And the mistake is to be dissatisfied with scientific explanations and to try to seek deeper ones. This is Professor Ard Louis. He's a new father and a professor of physics at Oxford University. He is definitely a meaning-seeking creature. I'm a scientist. I want to have a system that at least makes some sense of the world. And God plays an important part for me in bringing that whole of life experience together in a coherent whole. David Malone has spent 20 years making science documentaries. He is also a meaning-seeking creature, but one who doesn't believe meaning points to God. I'm as puzzled by people who are adamantly against religion as I am people who believe it. I just think, look, here we are, we're in the world, we have why questions, and we think things are meaningful. What is missing? Meaning and purpose. Really? Yeah. Five minutes ago you had meaning and purpose. Somebody pops up and says, here's the proof God doesn't exist. You go, oh my God. I'd be, I'd be very worried about it. I'd be tremendously worried. Really? Yeah, and I was... I haven't been worried about it all these years. Oh, maybe you should be. <laughs> <laughs> Together they are on a journey to see if it is possible to reconcile meaning, purpose, and perhaps even God with the workings of a purely material universe. The foundation of all modern science is what is called reductionism. And no modern scientist disputes its power. Reductionism has been physics' best friend, in the sense that it's been so useful as a way of making sense of what's going on because what it does is, if you have something very complicated, you break it into little bits, study the little bits, put things back together again, and hope that the toll is the sum of its parts. Reductionism is this idea that you can break into the parts, but the whole is nothing more than the sum of the parts. Exactly. The fact that every atom of hydrogen is the same around the universe is a triumph of reductionism, which is true, they are the same, you know. So there is this fundamental repetition, you know, of these basic building blocks. And that's why it's been so tantalizing to extend this notion to everything that is. And that is precisely what a controversial movement called scientism has done. For its supporters, Reductionism is not a powerful method of science. It is science. It is a philosophy which says everything must be explained from the bottom up, and those things which can't be must be let go. Is there a God? Of course not. What is the meaning of the universe? It doesn't have any. What is the purpose of life? Ditto. 
is there a, a difference between right and wrong, good and bad? Uh, there's not a moral difference between them. Uh, what is the nature of the relationship between the mind and the brain? They're identical, the mind is the brain. Is there free will, not a chance? Does the lessons of the past have any particular bearing that would help us cope with the future? Less and less if it ever had any at all. Can you tell us what you mean by scientism? Scientism, as the word is normally used, is a term of abuse. And what it means is the exaggerated respect for science's methods and science's findings. Uh, now, take that definition and remove the word exaggerated, and you've got my definition of scientism. Uh, scientism is the view that science is our best guide to the nature of reality, its methods, and its findings are our best account of the nature of reality. Um, when I weigh the philosophical puzzles against what science has accomplished over the 400 years since Galileo and Newton, when I weigh those in the balance, right, it seems to me that the balance is so heavily tipped towards science and its accomplishments by way of explaining and enabling us to understand nature and ourselves, that now, at the end of the 20th, beginning of the 21st century, there's still a package of problems that the sciences can't yet answer. Do I think that science will never answer them? No, that's what scientism consists in. It's the prediction that eventually we're going to successfully answer these questions. Peter Atkins is another prominent supporter of scientism. We're a hiccup on the way from one oblivion to another oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can't believe that. Yeah. Peter. Um, <laughs> we hope through the scientific method that we will understand absolutely everything. It's it's a wonderful challenge that you know, the world is out there in all its complexity. We, we little humans are tinkering with an understanding of little bits of it, but we're gradually migrating towards an understanding of the whole. What do you think the status of scientific knowledge is as it regards sort of other kinds of knowledge? Scientific knowledge is the only way of um, acquiring reliable knowledge because it's evidence-based and it's consensus-based it's universal, it's transcultural, and it's a, a, a way where you can be confident that the knowledge that you're gaining is reliable. Is that the whole story then, you were saying? Yes. That's absolutely. it, there's nothing, there's nothing more than that? No. Would that make us like computers almost? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I see nothing wrong with that. I mean, we're very elaborate computers. So, so I, I agree, I think we are chemical computers, but you're saying that's the totality of the... That's it. That's well, I don't see what else there could be. Um, it, on scientific grounds? Uh, well, just on common sense grounds. The thing about reductionism is that it tries to make the universe into a big machine, like clockwork. So, you know, there's this big engine behind everything. Then everything is explainable and everything is predictable. This is the ultimate determinism. And the consequence of this is that if everything is predictable, so is behavior, so is what I'm going to say now. And that makes us a prisoner of this machine. And that tells you that you are really not a free person, that there is no such thing as free will. And that's why the romantics were so pissed off at the scientists, you know, because they were saying, hey, it's all a big machine. And they would say, wait, wait a second, what about love and feelings and confusion and doubt? Where does that all fit into this new science you guys are talking about? That's not the whole picture. It cannot be the whole picture. And that is where reductionism starts to flounder. And many scientists, particularly life scientists, are not convinced that reductionism is enough. I think reductionism is the idea that from the molecular level, in principle, everything is there that is needed in order to know how your body works. And that cannot be true. For Dennis Noble, the inadequacy of reductionism first struck him when he discovered that the heart does not beat because it is driven by the underlying pulsing of proteins. 
but rather because those pulsings are organized into a regular beat by the heart as a whole system. It is a downward process of causation in which the properties of the cell constrain those proteins to behave differently from what they would do if they were in a Petri dish. But reductionism is very powerful though, isn't it? I mean, you're not, you're not saying reductionism, we shouldn't use it. Of course it's been hugely successful. It was fantastic and actually it's given us huge insights. So I'm not an anti-reductionist. I just think that you've got to recognize that there is an integrative process occurring in living organisms and those functional um, properties, the meaningfulness, if you like, in that function, that emerges and you can't escape from that. Once you have got a system that constrains the parts, it takes over. The system. The, the system takes over. Yes, because you've got something that constrains the components to, as it were, always go to a particular state. So the components build something, but once they've built that something... It takes over. That something then has an effect on the components that built it from there. Exactly so, yes. And so if you ignore the fact that that top-level description is acting on the... Lower then level, you're missing... Then you're missing a point. Well, then why are people so wedded to it? Well, because it is a powerful thing. For example, you figure out the molecular structure of DNA and suddenly it, it's very natural to think, well, that is so powerful, it must be the way of explaining everything. And that, only that method. Uh, only that method. I think, I think Dennis's point is to say, well, if you just use only that method, then you're missing something. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Because if I take the DNA out of a cell and I put it in a Petri dish with as many nutrients as you like, I can keep it for 10,000 years, it'll do absolutely nothing. It can't be the secret of life. Yes, so th this, this gets to the whole argument about are genes the recipe for life? Yes. Recipe is not bad. I mean, it's written down as a recipe, just like a music score is written down as a music score. But the recipe is not the dish. Yeah. And the, the score recipe, isn't the music. And the score is not the music, precisely. One of my big problems with the reductionists is not so much that their method has not been extremely powerful. It has been superbly powerful. It is the hubris the certainty that that's all there is. So is life just physics and chemistry? Or is there something about this arrangement of atoms that is more than the sum of its parts? Is that work for you or is that mumbo jumbo? That's mumbo jumbo. Oh. <laughs> I, I mean, all defeatism is mumbo jumbo, basically. Why is it defeatism? Well, because it suggests that there's something beyond the your understanding of the entities that make up the butterfly. I don't see why it's a defeat to say, well, in addition to the rules that govern the individual parts, there could be entirely scientific rules which operate at the level of the system. Yes, but we've got no need for them at the moment. But there are many scientists who think that the insistence that everything can be explained from the bottom up is too narrow. My definition of a fundamentalist is someone who takes a partial truth and claims it's the total truth. And that's exactly the problem here. If you say that statistical physics explains a lot of stuff, there's absolutely no problem. If you claim it explains everything, including life, it's simply not true. One should pursue bottom-up causation as far as one can, and it's very powerful, but it's not the only thing in existence. In fact, I'll make quite a strong claim there. If you want to create life, there's a level of a ceiling that you can reach by assembly of molecules and so on, and you can't get any further for one very simple reason, is that after a certain time, you've got to start adapting to your environment. Now, when that happens, the environment has to feed in signals to this organism now, that's top-down causation from the environment into the structure of the organism. And so I make a strong statement that purely bottom-up causation will not bring life into existence. Which would mean there was more to life than the sum of its parts. But if scientism and reductionism are correct, and life is reducible to nothing more than clever physics or chemistry, then what of human beings? And our sense of having a self or a soul
Do we have souls? Of course not. Not only do we not have souls, but I think that, that contemporary uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience suggests that we don't even have selves. Well, that's disturbing, because I was sure I had a self when I walked in. Right, you, you did have a self, but it may well be different now. A different self in your body. Is that what sci and science is telling us this? Yes, I think that a good deal of neuroscience is telling us this. Now, David, uh, you were pretty confident that you had a self when you walked in, and you're still confident that you had a self, and you will be confident t tomorrow. And we, all of us, are victims of a vast range of illusions foisted upon us by conscious introspection. Um, okay. of which the belief in an enduring self is probably one of the most difficult to undermine or dislodge. Why would I want to undermine it, though? Oh, in fact, you probably wouldn't want to undermine it, and it is the result, most probably, of a, a process that uh, is highly adaptive in our species, okay? But if you now go on to say, since I have this firm conviction, it must be true, Right. you then begin to worry about questions to which the answers are either negative or they turn out to be pseudo-questions. I'm not quite sure I understood that, because you seem to be saying, I do have what, myself. But it's made up. No, you, you have, you, it's a fiction. You think you have a self. And this conception has important use for us in our daily lives, but it doesn't have a foundation in the nature of psychological reality. The question for reductionism is, if describing thinking creatures as just the sum of their smallest parts fully captures what they are, or if it misses out those rules which hold all the parts together, The only animals that once you've fed us and watered us and given us a house, there's still a, a restlessness. And that restlessness is, I think, probably a search for meaning. I don't think that follows at all. I'm, I'm just sort of amazed at, at this. Science is in a position to explain why it is that human beings, once you feed us and clothe us and shelter us, should begin to worry about the nature of reality. We have this desire to look beyond ourselves. Mm -hmm. But science has explained that as a kind of a, um, a misfiring of our... Misfiring is the wrong word. Science explains it, and what it produces is a, a, a set of cultural institutions that produce the enjoyment and the satisfaction and the happiness and the grief of human life and that move us to action, okay? But which can't be taken seriously as descriptions of what's really out there. What does that mean? I mean, they're fun. They're entertaining, they're enjoyable. It's like when you listen to Beethoven's Ninth and you hear the Ode to Joy, it, it makes you cry. Scientism doesn't deny that it makes you cry, but to think that there's some world historical meaning beyond the emotional impact of a, a great work of art on us, that's what I think is the mistake and a mistake that science reveals to us. In any kind of way, Alex Rosenberg and I both agree. If you start from nothing but atoms and molecules, then you end up at his position. No morals, no meaning, no purpose, just a kind of nihilism. And we both agree, in a weird way, that if you want those things, you need to assume that there is a god. What you can't have is those nice things and no god. And that, I'm afraid, is the position that David is in. Do you think that there's a chance that Rosenberg could be right? Yeah, there's a chance he could be right. I'm sure there is. I don't think he's right, but there's a chance he could be right, yeah. It would be pretty depressing for you. Uh, I see it would be pretty depressing for me when yeah, I think about it. Yeah, it would be depressing for both of us, yeah. I think he just says there is no God. There's nothing but atoms and molecules. And if you start from there, that's where you end, I think. 
there is nothing. That's the bit that bothers me, Arden, because I think that there's atoms and molecules and there is no God. But I don't want to end up where he is because I do think the world has meaning in it and is meaningful. I think that's a very strong intuition that we all have, that life means something. And I, maybe one way of saying is that we should be careful of letting go of these intuitions too easily. Until we met Alex Rosenberg, I thought it was Ard was the one with the problem, trying to justify his belief in God against the atheists. But actually Ard's fine. I'm the one with the problem. God either exists or he doesn't, and if you believe he does, then there's no problem with meaning or purpose or any of the things that Ard and I agree on. The problem is defending meaning and purpose from reductionist science if you don't believe in God. How the hell can you two be in the same world? We just think the same way about it. We just take the same logic. We just have very different starting points. And from our two different starting points, we end up at completely different places. He thinks I'm completely wrong. I think he's completely wrong. And you two of you think that I live where in some weird world then? I think I don't, we don't quite understand your world. That's probably the right way of saying it. <laughs> For scientism, the very existence of the universe itself is something which has no meaning or significance. Do you think this question of why is the universe simple leads quickly to the kind of famous questions about why is there something rather than nothing? nothing. I don't think that it does, but that's an interesting question to which I think the science has given answer. Which is what? No reason at all. No reason at all. If the laws of physics in our universe were even very slightly different, then life would not exist. For many scientists, both religious and non-religious, this itself is a reason to see our universe as meaningful rather than meaningless. As a cosmologist, when one is about as why are the laws of physics as they are, you can ask how different can the laws of physics be and still enable life to exist. And it turns out there's a great many ways in which if you vary physics, pretty soon life cannot exist. And so there's what's called fine tuning, namely that physics has to lie in a very restricted range in order that we as living beings can come into existence. The extraordinary thing about our universe is that it is finely tuned for life. The more science has looked, the more fine-tuned the rules of this universe seem. Well, if you tweak just a little bit the proton mass, and stars would either not form at all, or if they form, they'll burn too fast, and if they burn too fast, you would not produce the heavier chemical elements, and it would be a completely different universe, and quite possibly without life. So when people jokingly say we're all stardust, it's not a joke. I mean, it's actually beautiful. It's true. All the chemical elements that we have in our bodies, you know, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your, in your blood, they belong to stars billions of years ago. Without fine-tuning, the stars would not behave the way they do. They would not produce the chemical elements that they do. And life as we know it, which depends on a whole set of different chemical elements, would not be possible. So the fine-tuning essentially means the constants of nature, they have the value that they do have, and because of that, we are possible. So the question becomes, why those values? And how do you account for that then? How do you account for it? 
Okay. Um, there are popular and unpopular <laughs> versions. Um, you, you can do it in three ways. The one is just to say it's just chance. It's not probable or improbable. It's just what happened. Now, that's a philosophically impeccable solution, but people don't like it because it doesn't get you anywhere. Well, it's not much of an explanation, is it? It's, it's philosophically impregnable. Well, OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay. OK, the second one is to try to say it's probable. So if you can imagine an ensemble of universes which actually exist, in some of them, life will be able to come into existence. Is that what people call the multiverse? That's the multiverse. And this is the scientifically preferred version. So there would there, be just many, many universes? Yeah. For its supporters, the advantage of the multiverse is that it contains so many universes that even our rare one is likely. When people start to calculate how many of these could be around, they came up with a ridiculously huge number, which is the one with 500 zeros afterwards. Many more particles than we have in the universe. Oh, oh pff, we have yeah, many, 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 many but more that's particles. That's a big number, then. It is a ridiculous number, which means, now what? Um, I have a problem with this because if there is that multiverse out there, the question is, can you prove it exists? And in my view, you basically can't. So I think this is a philosophical but not a scientific solution to the problem. Which leaves the third explanation, which scientism likes least, God. Where did the universe come from? Do you think science can answer that question? Well, nothing else can. Well, I mean, do you think we've we have... other obviously um, theology thinks it can? Okay. <laughs> By saying it was the the workings of the finger of God which stirred up nothing, and out of it came the universe. This is not, to my mind, a very satisfying um, explanation. And when you say but, nothing, what do you mean by nothing? Do you mean? I mean what everyone means by nothing. I means absolutely nothing. So where did not even where, a void? Not even a void. So where did the voids and the laws of physics come from? God knows. God knows. God knows. <laughs> <laughs> In, uh, I'm using that, of course, allegorically. I must say that. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Why the universe is fine-tuned is a mystery, but it is. It's fine-tuned not only for life, but for intelligent life. You can divide the history of the universe into four ages. The, the physical age, which is the, from the Big Bang to the first stars, up to that point there was no chemistry, right? And then you call the chemical age, which is when the first stars burn and create the periodic table of elements. Then you have the biological age, which is when some of these chemicals, you know, self-organize to create life. And then after the biological age, there was the cognitive age, which is when some of these living creatures became so sophisticated that they were able to ask questions such as the ones we've been talking about. So these are the four ages, and they all have different laws. This is, this, come and have a look at this all. This is basically my database for convergence. When the biological age began and life emerged, it did bring a new rule into the universe natural selection. And what's exciting a growing number of scientists is that, for all natural selection is random, there are also patterns and trends to what evolves, which suggests that some things may be nearly inevitable. Which physicists say can't be done, no, exactly. but biology has said, has yes, we can. Okay. One for the biologists. <laughs> there we are. No, yeah, no, no, so no. that's another, another <laughs> example. So there we go. There we go. <laughs> If you were to rerun the tape of life again, would something like ourselves grace the replay? Well, if we were to rerun the tape of life, my estimation would be that indeed there would be something really pretty similar to a human, in fact, something pretty similar to this conversation, but there would also be an entire biosphere. So I'm not restricting the argument merely to intelligent bipeds with skills of manipulation and higher cognition. There would be animals in the sea, there would be plants in the forest, but in each and every case, the sort of end form which we see today from the beginnings of the Cambrian explosion would be surprisingly predictable. One has to also point out that not only is there a recurrence in biology, this is what we call evolutionary convergence, but there's also evidence that in a broad sense things are becoming more interesting, almost more complex. So there are, if you like, trends towards greater complexity, 
But, but beneath that, there's a sort of drumbeat, which more or less says, how many ways can you do something? How many ways can you fly? How many ways can you swim? How many ways can you breathe? How many ways can you think? If you look at the total number of alternatives which biology in principle could throw up, the numbers are stupendously, stupidly big. Out of this immensity of possibilities, at least on this planet, the total number of solutions is a handful. You were saying earlier that there is a directionality towards higher complexity. Yeah. That's a trend, right? Yes, I mean, th there are, I think there is very good evidence that through geological time, things have become more interesting, if you like, more complex. So far as biology is concerned, so far as Darwinian evolution is concerned, it is completely and utterly blind. When Richard Dawkins refers to the blind watchmaker, I absolutely agree with him. Evolution per se does not know where it's going. So it's random, but because certain solutions are just the solutions that work, then natural selection will randomly find them. The processes may at one level be more or less random. It's the throwing the dice again and again. It's trying and trying and trying. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with randomness. <laughs> the world won't work without it, but the world is also ordered. And it's in a sense a paradox of how do you get this self-order emerging from what is originally, of course, just this sea of early particles and coalesces not only into planets and galaxies and all those good things, but also life forms, which in a certain sense begin to step out of physics and chemistry into new worlds. The randomness we've been talking mostly about is really in a Darwinian yeah. and evolutionary framework, whereas if we look at the physical organization of the universe, it is very, very highly ordered indeed. And the paradox, and I think it's actually an interesting question, is you know, what is it about life? What is this thing, this sort of extraordinary thing which hovers between chaotic, gas-like behaviour where nothing ever settles down to an immobile, crystalline-like form? And life in this sort of metaphor is sort of, describes this incredibly narrow line, it's sort of tiptoeing all the way along like this. And yet it's that expression of the universe which then looks back at the stars and says, what on earth are we doing here? He mentioned this thing of not too many rules, not too chaotic, but something in the middle. I thought, I, I was sort of tempted to look over at you because I thought you, your fluffometer was going to go off and no, that you no, would no, say, no. oh, no, no, that's no, no, just too that's hippie, too that's too hippie I think there is something about life which is really extraordinary. So life is really, really different yeah. from crystals, completely different from gases. And With so its we, own rules. Its own rules and its own set of, its own set of emergent rules, which are different. Uh, that's what I asked him about yeah, that. Yeah. He was a little bit cagey, cagey about that. Why? Why was he know, cagey about that? Because he, he, he all just, but said it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe he's got bad connotations for him. I mean, the word emergence has been sometimes badly used, and so... By fluffy people. By fluffy people, exactly. But I think he was giving a description very much along those lines, saying yeah. he, there are these new laws that appear, yeah. and that you don't find those laws until you get to that new level of description. It's not as if... It's all, it can all be explained by the underlying reductionist story, and that's it. I think in certain oh, when quarters, I was at university, you yeah. said that sort of thing. Yeah, but I think that was just because you were badly taught. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps simple life can be explained as nothing but complex physics and chemistry. But for many scientists, it's the existence of thought and ideas which is the real challenge to pure reductionism. Some scientists believe that ideas are a truly emergent level, something which cannot be explained by reducing it to the movement of atoms and molecules. You can explain all of the properties of the brain in terms of the physics of the molecules, the neurons and all the rest of it, but you can't explain the ideas in there. It isn't even conceivable you could do that. And so that phrase that, that Rosenberg used where he says, the physical facts fix everything. That is not true. I think a very good place to start is digital computers. A digital computer, at the bottommost level, it's electrons flowing through the gates in a particular way, and that's what controls what happens at the screens. So there's the hardware sitting there. It doesn't do a thing until you load it up with a program. So the hardware per se does not determine what happens. What determines is the program that you load in. 
a computer program, it's an abstract entity, it's not a physical thing. That abstract logic then gets written into a high level code. And then interpreters or compilers write it down into the lower level languages. Exactly the same logic is present at every level. So at the bottom level it gets turned into instructions at the gate. Now what is a computer program? It's the equivalence class of all of these representations. It's an abstract thing. Does it have causal power? Yes, it causes things to happen. So you're saying an abstract logic? Abstract logic is, has, has got physical power. outcomes in the real world through being what is implemented in the computer. So then, of course, the old philosophers of mind would say, but you're talking a dualist position. My answer is, yes, I am. A computer is a dualist machine. There's the hardware and the software. Yes, so I take the completely unpopular position. I'm a dualist. There's the mind and the brain. And the, the mind inhabits the brain. And some say, or thoughts. Let's say take talk. Thoughts inhabit the brain. And thoughts are not physical things. Thoughts are abstract things which get represented in a physical way. And again, we do not understand how this happened, but the brain has a hierarchical structure. Thoughts have a hierarchical structure. And in the computer, you can see these different levels. You can understand them. And you have got these interpreters or compilers which do it. I think eventually when we understand the brain enough, we will see exactly the same kind of structure happening in the brain. If ideas act on the world in a way that isn't completely dictated by the movement of particles, then we are more than just chemical computers. We would be, as we have always felt ourselves to be, creatures whose joys and thoughts matter. Abstract entities are driving the physics at the bottom level. The physics is not controlling what happens. And from my viewpoint, Existence isn't just physical existence, there's these abstract existences. So then you, you, you should ask me in philosophical terms, how do I justify the word existence? And I've got a very simple answer to that. I take the existence of physical entities as being real. So in other words, I've got in my hand a pair of spectacles. Now, how did that come into existence? Someone had the idea of a pair of spectacles and then created these by a machine and so on. If they hadn't had that idea, this wouldn't exist. So that idea has to be real too, even though it's not a physical entity. So that realm of ideas you're talking about, you would say that came into existence in the Big Bang along with... I, along I, with I, I wouldn't necessarily say it came into... I, I think it might in some sense pre-exist the Big Bang. Oh, OK. Pre-exist. But, it, but, pre it, but it, it, it exists. So then what natural selection is doing was creating more and more complicated minds or brains rather which eventually and at could... some point they they can access yes. this realm that is correct that is correct and so that thing that space of abstract stuff was sitting there waiting to be discovered and eventually minds reached a sufficient complexity that they could discover it but that space doesn't need minds to exist it's there it's there already yeah but for scientism Emergence is wrong, and even our thoughts and feelings can be nothing but complicated mechanics. So we're animals. I think nobody just we're, you know, without a divine spark. Without a divine spark, but but there's nothing beyond the fact that we're animals. We're no different from it. Yes, right. Nothing but unlike but. a lot of animals, we have thoughts. Yes, unlike a lot of animals, but like a lot of animals. Yes, but the, there's a qualitative difference in the thinking which is we are capable of than most of the rest. So in other words, I think yes, I just, we're, we're animals, but there's something has emerged in I our evolution. I just don't think I'm going to grant that. If you want to use the word emergent or irreducibly complex or valuative, uh, then I think these are um, placeholders for questions on the agenda of science. At this point, we don't have a good handle on the details of the answer to this question that I favor. And you, holding an alternative view, have probably even less grounds for confidence. So, yeah. so David doesn't believe in God at all. No, no, but, but he does believe in the existence in emergent properties. Well, I, I, I think, you, that, you think that's, a, you think that's a, something he should let go of, emergent properties? Yeah. 
See, what, why? why? Or could... alternatively, I think you should treat emergent properties as a signal or a flag that indicates a domain or a terrain in which science has some work to do. Could there not be a proper science which did include emergence? So, which would be scientific. When I look at the history of science, I look at the history of people drawing uh, lines in the sand and challenging science to transcend them, and science successively doing it. And people say, reduce this, I dare you, and science eventually finds a way to do it. You think that some of the resistance you've faced from the reductionists has been a kind of fear of religion, that you're, yes. you're worried you're going to sneak God back in. And not so that only that, I was one of the few to argue against the reductionist case, and I expected two or three others to help me. One did, another didn't, and he came up to me and said, Dennis, I would support you if I didn't think that that brings God back in. That's so weird. Of course, in the neo-Darwinist context, it's the fear of all of those creationists. And, you know, somehow or another, if you let this structure collapse, and I think it is collapsing, incidentally, it's a house of cards built on some very bad uh, concepts and some very poor science. Poor because of the insistence that it's the only truth. If you let that crumble, what then happens? The creationists will have a field day saying, you know, you were all wrong. I think part of the problem is that people have been throwing the baby out with the bathwater. They've been throwing out concepts like spirituality, which I think is a form of creative novelty, of the ability to give meaning to things. That is our spirituality, to be able to give yeah. meaning to things. If you're a religious scientist like I am, you don't think of your science as being over here and your religion as being over there. You think of your religious way of looking at the world being everything, and science is just a part of it. So I think that my Christian faith helps me explain why science works. If I start from the idea that there is a God, it's much more natural to find something like the understandability of the universe. So for me, science has deep Christian roots, but it's only part of the picture. That doesn't make science any less powerful or beautiful, just makes me realize that science is not the whole story. How about people like myself who are religious and scientists? What, what do you make of that? Religious knowledge is probably the paradigm of unreliability because, <laughs> because it's based on sentiment, on authority, and on wish fulfillment. So I think you know the, those three aspects of religious knowledge undermine its reliability t totally. Well, what about the arts and, then? Yeah, I was going to say, for a poet to say that they're providing uh, knowledge about the world is um, tolerable up to a point. <laughs> they're 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 pro <laughs> they're providing uh, something to study. I, I think the core of science is imagination in alliance with honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, just to be honest, without being imaginative, means that you're not very, doing very good science. <laughs> being imaginative without being honest means that you're being a poet. So, um, <laughs> and there's the divide between those who think you understand the world by reducing it to its smallest parts and those who say intelligent life has to be more for all its wonderful achievements and to which we all owe so much, science has, in some people's minds, led to, led to a sort of downward spiral that something's only valid if we can produce experimental data or graphs or quant. But if you're trying to understand someone listening to a Beethoven symphony, or someone discussing a problem with their wife or whatever, that has me both those things have meaning. And it's absurd to think that some computer printout or diagram of what's going on in the brain could capture the meaning of what's happening in a relationship or in a, in a musical uh, enterprise. So when you think about it as absurd, nonetheless, it exerts a seductive pull on people. I think if only we can get the, the data, that's we've got to the essence of the phenomenon. 
And so that's in a way what, this, what scientism, as opposed to science, is saying. Trying to reduce things down to whatever can be quantified, measured, or put up in an overhead projector. To say that reductionism fails doesn't mean that there is more to it than matter. It doesn't mean that there is some sort of soul or spirit okay. that is controlling stuff. It just means that science cannot do that job. Some scientists, you know, the, the ones that go push reductionism all the way to the end, they're asking science much more than, than, than science should be able to, to answer, which is to answer everything. And so this belief, because it's nothing more than a belief, really, you know, that science can probe into the behavior of everything and come up with final answers about who you are or even about what nature is, right, is really, I, I think, uh, a misunderstanding of what science is about and how science actually operates. So to me, you know, this new science, instead of saying, oh, the universe is enormous, we are nothing, we're just machines, we have no free will, no. We are actually incredibly important because without us, you know, the universe wouldn't have any meaning because there would be no one to think about meaning in the universe. So perhaps the miracle of our universe is that it has meaning and has evolved creatures who are able to see it and spend their lives exploring how that felt but unseen world of truth and meaning works. We have no instrument by which to record the absolute nature of reality, because whatever instrument that is will at some point be filtered through the lens of, of consciousness, of us. Certainty is bad because it's uncreative. It means you know already, you don't need to think anymore about it. The thinking you have all the truth is very bad because then it's a prison. Then we might as well not be alive. We are in fact capable of having these huge realizations, ones that actually overwhelm us, make us feel that we are understanding something that we perhaps shouldn't, that, that we shouldn't go there, this idea of, you know, where angels fear to tread. Mm -hmm.